So the hidden danger, the biggest hidden danger in astronomy is aperture fever. You start out, you get involved in astronomy, you've got a pair of binoculars, you've got your telescope, whatever it is, you start seeing the moon, you see some of the planets, uh, deep space objects on there, and, and you're just blown away. You're, you're literally absolutely blown away. And then as you become more familiar and you're able to, to navigate your way around your front yard, you want more light. You want things bigger. And, and you start going bigger and bigger and bigger. That, that three-inch telescope, you go up to a six, you go up to an eight-inch, you go up to a 10, you go up to a 12. You're thinking, okay, uh, you know, a 16-inch Dobsonian, how can I sneak that into the house? And, and your telescopes get bigger and bigger and bigger to the point where, like, it's so big, you need, it becomes not only overwhelming, but you need, like, the ultimate um, setup to make it work, right? If, if it's cloudy out, if it's kind of cold out, and the telescope's going to cool down, take forever, you're like, I'm not going to go out and observe. It's too complicated. And then you scale things back to what you like on there. Um, the biggest I ever went was 12-inch Dobsonian. I'm more of a glass man, so these days it's either a Teleview Ranger or my, um, my six-inch refractor. Pushing that over, I, I use that analogy because it, it captures it so well and it, it, it sneaks up on you. The same thing happens with board games. And I want to explore in this podcast, building on my astronomy analogy here, um, in terms of the evolution of your collection on there. Because it's just as dangerous. It's just as deceptive. You get into board games and there's a lot of things happening behind the scenes and how things evolve, you need to be very, very careful. I'm going to push that out, and then we'll see where you are in your board gaming evolution. So you get into board games for whatever reason. doesn't matter how I leave that open. You are now in the acquisition phase where you are collecting everything you can get your hands on. Often your initial game collection will consist of games that you've played with your friends or at the club the gaming group because that's what you're familiar with and and you kind of like everything or i should say and i don't mean this in a negative way i really don't you don't know what you like on there because because you're learning so your collection grows very very fast you're just trying to acquire as many titles as you can have um, a massive diversity of games experience everything new and absolute the challenge here at this this first stage of the hobby or i should say lifestyle is you're learning what you like, and you don't have to acquire everything at first. It's almost like it's better off for the first couple of months of, of board gaming or first half year, and not saying I did this or it's easy to have restraint. Don't acquire anything. Just, just play games that your friends have because it would be better to save up your resources, and then when you're ready to jump into phase two, it would be easier and more efficient to pump your resources, your, your physical money into that. So you, you collect everything. You don't know what you like. You just know you're having a great time playing games with your friends and solo. So the more games you acquire, the more fun you will have. Along the way, you start to develop a, a gaming personality. And I'm not saying you're a boring dud. I'm literally talking about you're, you're figuring out what type of games and what type of mechanics that a uh, game mechanics that you like. I, I love dungeon crawling games. I love miniature type games on there. We won't pass judgment if that's right or wrong. That's not to say uh, I don't like playing classic games like Settlers or I don't mind kind of competition games like Game of Thrones. I, I, I do. I'll play them. But I play them when my friends bring them. My own collection acquisition, I, I know the type of games, the themes, the narratives, the mechanics that I like. So as you develop that, that personality of what you personally like after about a year, now your acquisition changes to just capturing those games. And now you've got a ton of games that there's nothing wrong with them, but they really weren't your type of games. And do you trade them? Do you keep them? Maybe you'll play them again at some point. They, they kind of become a second tier in your collection. But now you're kind of in a new place because now you, I love dungeon crawlers, Fritz, I'm just dungeon crawlers, dungeon crawlers. Well, now you just acquire everything that you possibly can for dungeon crawlers on there. You're essentially um, repeating that first acquisition phase, but just in a focused way. 
we go through that phase on there. Maybe you show some restraint. Maybe you don't. And now you come to a sub-phase on there. So you know the type of games that you like to play. And you know for the most part these games can be played um, with a group or in a gaming session. But then there's certain games within that, that subset that are very complex. They're very good games. They're very complex. They take a commitment to play. Um, an example would be something like Twilight Imperium, Kingdom Death Monster. These are games that are amazing game experiences, but they play long. They play multiple plays. They work best with the same group on there. Um, they're definitely not pickup games. They're not Zombie Side Black Plague, where you can just bring it to the club and you can play and have a great time playing it. But you acquire these games and you become frustrated because you're like using TI, Twilight Imperium, as an example. It's within the framework that you like. You acquire it. You try to play it as much as you can, but you can't. You get frustrated because you're like, this is a great game, but why isn't it working? Because you realize it requires a special set of circumstances or you have to set those circumstances up. This is where now your collection starts to branch off. We're entering the next phase on here. And in this next phase, you realize that within your player personality and the collection of games that you want to curate, you realize that there are games that I'm always going to go to and I'm always going to play either in a group or solo. Um, they get the most rotation. And, and you're good with that. You're cool with that. But then there's going to be kind of um, your top shelf games. Games like Twilight Imperium, Kingdom Death Monster. Those are examples from, from my collection that you're not going to get to play as much. You're sad face about that, but you acknowledge that. So those experiences you're willing to have a couple of times a year. You're willing to set up something special. They occupy, it's like birthday parties and holidays and special events. They're amazing, but they only happen a few times a year. The rest of the time, you know, there's those other games on there. So your collection kind of splits. Then at some point, you start to pare your collection down. And you start to um, discriminate a little bit more. You start to kind of really look and say, uh, I have a lot of titles, and I know I'm comfortable with the games I like to play and the systems I like. So I don't need to acquire as much because, A, I'm never going to really play all this stuff. Um, but at the same time, if I do have time to play, I know what I like. And, and what you like is what you like on there. So I want to focus on those titles. So now you start to see you, you go almost um, vertical in that you're now looking to acquire expansions, fan content, custom components, um, homebrew stuff, and, and really say, hey, these are like the 10, 15 titles that I love. I'm going to just go 100% into them. And then I'll say the last kind of evolution on there, but I'm sure there's mu multiple, multiple layers to it. Um, now you start to look and you know, these are the games I like. These are the type of games that I enjoy. And I'm willing to invest in components and expansions and, and you know, sleeving everything and, and making the, everything as elite as I can. When new titles come out, we're always seduced initially, right? We're always seduced initially by it. But now you're really going to look and say, is this something that I really want to acquire? Is this something that because I know if I add it to my game collection, I'm going to go all in. I'm going to stay on top of the expansions. I'm going to stay on top of the news of it. You know, I'm going to bling it all out, custom components. You know, is this like a, a, a new family member I want to bring into the group? You know, is this, do I want to acquire this? So you, you, your collection slows down, your acquisition slows down tremendously. But the, the customization increases incredibly. You know, you start painting your miniatures perhaps on there. You, you go for the premium game mat, just um, all that on that experience, and your collection becomes a lot more focused. That's, that's what I've observed. But uh, going back to the astronomy analogy, something happens where you're upgrading your scopes to bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. You know, binoculars too. Uh, these days my workhorse is a pair of 60s and a pair of 80s. Um, but there was, time, there was a time I was holding, um, you know, pair of 100 binoculars and I'm like I can't hold anything steady my neck is 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 ready to crack um my arms can't hold this massive binocular up I'm trying to freehand hand hold this stuff and I'm like this is insane 
this is like, you know, and then I'm like, well, if I mount it on a, a tripod, it's got to be pretty heavy-duty tripod, and I might as well be all in on a telescope for that. It's defeating the whole purpose of binoculars. But in, in astronomy, you're not aware of, of that addiction to going bigger and bigger and bigger for this uh, equipment. I, I, I've seen the same exact thing because I was there, and I see it in my friends that are new to the hobby, and I'm like, this parallels astronomy perfectly. There's an acquisition phase that you go through that you're not even aware about. And, and if we can become aware of it, and part of, that, part of the fun in the hobby is going through this. But I'm pushing this up there because if we can become aware of it and be made aware of it, now you can – I've never really been able to show any restraint, so I sh- who am I to say this? But in theory, if we can show some restraint and save some resources, then when it's time to commit – and it's time to go all in on that Kickstarter because you know you're going to love it and all the expansions and all the extras and all the premium tokens, you have the resources ready to go ahead and do that. So I'm going to flip it over to you guys. Um, what's that acquisition schedule? What's that, that, that flow through the board gaming hobby and what does it look like? 